Hello, this is Jason. Back with another walk and talk. And it is a absolutely beautiful day. And I'm walking just with the Action 5 Pro attached to my waist. The experiment was successful, I think. When I watched back the video, there wasn't really any jittering. So I think this is an acceptable way to mount this Action 5. To... There's my alert going off from my camera seeing me walk out the door. That was a little, little delayed there. <clears throat> but yeah, this, this mounting is a good way to do it and it's you know very convenient for me especially without the face cam i think the face cam thing is cool like if i uh if you want to see my reactions from something i'll probably do that but i think just for these walk and talk videos from what i've heard people rarely even watch them they just like let them play and listen to them let me know how you actually consume these because i mean i'm walking through the same areas not much new is going on maybe instead of going left like yesterday i'll go right mix things up but you've seen me go this way many times before I'm not exploring new territories <laughs> it's just uh, you know same scenery now maybe when I go to Bangkok and I'm like walking through a market and want to see what's going on in the market and see my reactions to the things in the market and Maybe I'll, that's when I'll use a face cam. <clears throat> but this, just strapping a, the Action 5 on a belt. And I have like this little, I have this elastic belt that like right now I'm just wearing like gym shorts. So there's no belt loops or anything, but this little elastic belt goes right around my waist. So this is different than how I had it mounted yesterday. So we'll see if this is yet another experiment. <clears throat> we'll see if this elastic belt makes it too bouncy. Yesterday I had it mounted on my, uh, my Peak Design hip bag. It was, it's a little bit more solid. But this is a uh, elastic key, so it could be a little more bouncy. We'll see. We'll see how it turns out. But like I said, I don't think many people actually watch the video. Let me know in the comments how you actually consume these videos. Not many people watch them anyway. <laughs> or even listen to them. Let them play. But if, if people would have, when I started... Uh, talking about Bitcoin back in, when's it been? I think I really started talking about it on a regular, like last September. I was on my uh, Jason MP78 channel, Walk and Talk. My Walk and Talk videos bounced around a little bit. Was posting them on my main channel, but then I thought people, it's just not many people want to watch these videos. I didn't want to post them on my main channel. And then I post them on Jason MP78. And then I made the walk and talk with Jason channel. And now we're over on some more Jason. So thanks to all the people that followed me around through all that experimentation. <laughs> now we're this is, this is how it's going to be. But yeah, I was posting about 
you know, my first real long video about Bitcoin. It was early September, and that was, Bitcoin was kind of bottoming, and that's where I was really uh, repositioning like my retirement portfolios and stuff, going more into it. Because I've, I've always been, and yes, I'm going to be talking about Bitcoin more. Because <laughs> this, is, this is like really important stuff. Like people think that Bitcoin is just a, I don't know, the pyramid, Ponzi scheme, uh, fluke, fake money, uh, whatever other negative connotations you can give to it. But it's, and, and maybe it's because it was called Bitcoin. Like it just sounds like it's some, you know, digital money, fake monopoly money. But what it really is, is the first decentralized secure network, a way of transferring digital assets across the internet without a central authority. It's a way to remove banks and governments and make everything peer-to-peer, peer-to-peer transactions. I mean, it was, it was kind of what, uh, like, thinking of other, I mean, it's as it's big as the internet. It's as big of an idea as the internet. So I was super into the internet. I've always been on the like bleeding edge of technology. So I can understand why like most people don't get this, but I was back in the late eighties, early nineties, like I'm 12 years old <laughs> and I'm all into the internet. I was like signing on to prodigy and just actually the first internet if you it wasn't even really internet it was just local bulletin boards like use use net and you'd call up the local number you had to pay like and my friend terry morrison had this first he had a, a computer i forget what it was think just like a Radio Shack computer you know you got a monochrome monitor didn't even have color monitors you just and it's all text there's no graphics like the only graphics that made were like text art where people make pictures out of text <laughs> and you just call and it would be like stories you just read stories and trend tr like just trading ideas and information it wasn't really trading pictures or music or all the other things that it turned into but it it spread and it grew and, and that's really where we are in the in the bitcoin cycle the adoption phase of the market cap we're like that's how early we are like i think the internet was invented in in the 70s and I really didn't start getting into it much until, you know, I wasn't even born when it was first, the first transmissions over a network from college to college. That's what the, you know, the first internet did was just sending information between colleges, I think is what some of the first uses was <coughs> for like research and stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I, once I got into it, it was already about, let's say, by 1990. I would say it was at least, I don't know the exact dates. I don't do prior research before talking about these things. So all this information is just based off of things that I've known or read from years ago. So I'm not completely accurate, but I try to go back and fact check myself after the fact <laughs> and maybe pop up some information on the screen that 
will tell you the actual real information. So if you're not watching the video and you care about uh, what the real statistics and facts are, watching the video, usually I'll pop up like the internet was actually invented in 1873. You know, <laughs> I know that's not the case, but you know what I'm saying? It's probably 1973 is what I'm guessing. Like the, and they didn't call it the internet. It was just the first like network. All right. So, you know, I get into it in like 1990, late 80s, 89, 90. I'm 11, 12. And like all I was getting off of it was like information. I remember I downloaded a, like you could download books. That was the first thing that started getting like pirated and you know, information that's spreading was books. I remember I downloaded the uh, Anarchist Cookbook <laughs> and printed it out, put it in a like binder folder. This was sometime in the early 90s and I was selling them, which there's like recipes for making bombs and stuff in it. But you could go to the library right now and, you know, go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble. I'm not sure if Amazon sells it. They might not. They may. <laughs> Just like the Anarchist Cookbook. And then there's another one. It's called the Jolly Roger Cookbook. And it's like the same thing. Like we made like tennis ball bombs out of tennis balls and uh, strike anywhere matches. You could strike anywhere matches and cut the heads off of them and then cut open a tennis ball and pack it in until it's full. Like you don't push it, pack it, but fill it up, tape it up with duct tape and then throw the tennis ball and it goes off like a 12 gauge shotgun. And it almost blew my fingers off with a little click pen bomb that I made with match heads. <sighs> you click the click the pen, it strikes a match and lights a bunch of powder inside the pen and blows up. So I clicked it and I dropped it, but it only fell like an inch or two away from my hand before it blew up. <sighs> How stupid. <laughs> I was young young teenager doing this stuff. That's probably uh, 13 maybe. And then like the, you know, the first scanners come out. So all, all this relates to Bitcoin. It's the, like the early adoption of the internet. No one, no one cared about the internet back then when I was doing all this stuff on the internet and getting information and selling books. Like I sold multiples of those books at school for like, I sold one for $500. And this is back in like 1991, 92. And I downloaded it for free and printed it out for free. And my friend's, my friend's dad had a home office and we bought like a binder. And so it was free. So I split the money with my friend and, you know, we sold several of them. <laughs> and then one of the kids' moms found it that, that I sold it to and uh, called the police. The police didn't know what to do and called the FBI. And then I get a call from, well, my mom got a call from the FBI. So, Miss Phillips, uh, this is blah, blah, blah with the FBI. We would like to have a word with your son. And <laughs> my mom about freaked out. The FBI, Jason, the FBI? You just skip local law enforcement altogether. The FBI. And we had to go in and get interviewed. So that was pretty crazy. But, you know, nothing happened. And it was, so this will help me pin down when the exact date was. Because it was the same year as the Oklahoma City bombing. And so I'm selling bomb books and the FBI is like, following any leads possible 
of who could be responsible for this Oklahoma City bombing. And so I'm getting interviewed about the Oklahoma City bombing because I sold bomb books at school. And like, I'm no uh, bomb mastermind. And I, I took in the book, it was the uh, Internet for Dummies. <laughs> and in the Internet for Dummies, it had this, it was either the Jolly Roger cookbook or the Anarchist cookbook in, in that book with a link to where to download it. And like, this is where I got it. Like, see, I'm no mastermind. I had the Internet for Dummies <laughs> book. I downloaded a link from there and printed it out. It's not, it wasn't rocket science. <laughs> so nothing really happened with that, but just the fact that the FBI was interviewing me, my mom really freaked out about that one. And I, I became notorious at school because everyone found out about it. It was a small little town, so anything that happens there, everyone knows. So like people would be signing my yearbook, like my science teachers, like signed my yearbook and I think it was the se my senior year and they were like thanks for not blowing up the school <laughs> I go, oh, you're welcome <sighs> so anyway next after people are just trading or sharing information it grows the network grows and there's a, a term for uh like the value of a network as it grows and, and networks that are growing like exponentially. <sighs> there's, there's all kinds of theories and formulas that go along with that, but that's, that's like what the, net, the internet was doing. It's just like exponential growth. And there was no way to just, you know, buy a share of the internet. You had to invest in companies that were like making use of the internet so there's no like internet fund you can just buy into and that's that's a difference between the internet and bitcoin where you can just buy bitcoin and you're buying a piece of this network that is going to allow the decentralized transfer of digital assets across the wor world at the speed of light, no intermediaries. It, it changes the world. The technology behind it, blockchain, is it's revolutionary. It's a way to uh, you know send property not only across space but through time. He had to solve the double spend problem which you know wouldn't allow you to be disconnected from one part of the network and and send property bitcoin from you know one person to another say in America and have someone else see that do the same thing like if you synchronized it so you're both doing it at the same time that that was like a vulnerability of networks back before bitcoin it was the the double spend problem no one could solve it and Satoshi Nakamoto solved it with the blockchain and having verifications blocks only created once every 10 minutes and then solving it with a, you know, SHA-256 encryptions, solving the, uh, you know, problems, the hash rate of the whole network. So it made it so difficult to try to inject a transaction in, in between, that it, it just can't be done. And now, like I, I talked about, like SHA-256 would take billions of years to to crack using all the computer power of the entire world. So no one's going to do that. Very secure. And now we could send a digital property across space and through time. So, next was just like a images. We're, we're scanning. Remember, I had a little scanner and I'd scan images. And then I used that to uh, 
scan report cards and we had a very uh, primitive version of Photoshop back then enough that I could change an F to an A and print it out on my dot matrix printer but I only had black and white printer and the report cards had like <coughs> had blue in them but no one really noticed that was a minor detail that parents overlooked so then I was selling fake report cards people give me their report cards to take it home scan it <laughs> on my computer change the grades <clears throat> so I wasn't you know changing grades really at the school I'm just changing their report card that they're gonna go show their parents <laughs> and uh, one of my friends Jer he had like all D's and F's he was practically failing I'm like what do you want the grades to be he's like make all the D's B's and make all the F's A's <laughs> I'm like I'm like you're gonna be on the honor roll he's like yep <laughs> so his parents were so proud oh my gosh Jer you're on the honor roll <laughs> I told him he probably shouldn't make it you know so drastic of a change but no one no one got caught that I know I did that for years every every quarter when report cards came out the uh, Jason report card business would fire up and I would do a lot of them <laughs> so uh yeah, my early adoption of computers and entrepreneurial businesses that I created from them. Uh, yeah, it's kind of funny. All right, so, and then next came uh, MP3s and being able to send music over the internet. And then Napster came about and like LimeWire, and those were all P2P. So that was kind of the first taste of, of decentralized peer-to-peer. -peer. Cause even the internet up till then, you would have just a server, you're connected to a server, news groups, you connect all these servers, you put information onto the server and someone else could pull that information off of the server. You know, you dial into AOL, and you connect AOL servers, post information to their servers, and then someone else could read it off their servers. But things like Napster and LimeWire and I forget all the other clients that popped up, they're all peer-to-peer, peer-to-peer networks. But it wasn't sending anything like really valuable across those networks. Like if you would uh, have a drop of connection. And those were like decentralized, not specifically one peer to the other peer. It was more like 10,000 peers to one peer where you're downloading a part of a song from one person. And, and so it wasn't quite the same as like Bitcoin because the information that's coming across didn't, wasn't valuable really. If you lost a piece of it, you just re-download it from someone else because everyone else had it. <clears throat> so that would be like if you had a digital, if you had a Bitcoin, if there was only one Bitcoin and everyone had that one Bitcoin, you could down that one Bitcoin from everyone else. But then there, it's just making copies of that one Bitcoin. That's You can't tell it's not unique. So it really can't be used as something of value or property that's yours because it's the same as everyone else's. So you can't tell if this is mine or, you know, it's just copies. And I was kind of figuring out a way to copy things and share them to many people across the internet. And then they did the same thing to and, and all, all the bandwidth of the network as it's growing, 
technology is increasing, speeds are getting faster. I can remember starting on like a 9600 baud modem, then going to 14.4, then it jumped up to 56k. So that's less, it's like very slow <laughs> by today's standards. And then getting like, it was all kilobits per second, like 500 kilobits, like ISDN lines and you know, the, the network was growing, but like we didn't get into like really over a, a megabyte per second till at least at the consumer level until around like 2000 when like cable internet started spreading. <clears throat> and then that's really when sharing videos became possible. And I remember Google had Google Video, and that started, that might have been like, I can't say for sure, 2000, I think they may have been around before YouTube, can't remember, but YouTube started like somewhere around 2006, 2007, and then that was a, a way to share videos. But there was also peer-to-peer -peer videos before that in the same way that MP3s were shared. They had uh, sharing just video files. And then BitTorrent came around, which that's another peer-to-peer -peer network, de decentralized but distributed network. And they do have servers there that have to track who has the files. So there still ha is some like central servers that have to be involved in that. <sighs> but then after the 08 financial crisis, that's when Satoshi Nakamoto just pretty much realizing that not having a way to be able to store your wealth in, uh, you know, everyone stores their wealth in banks, stocks, it's all on servers. <clears throat> and, and, there, and there was other things before this too, like e-cash and or e-gold, bit gold. I forget the names of them, but there, there was versions. It wasn't a complete Bitcoin solution, but they had centralized people that would be exchanges that I think you had to go through. It wasn't completely peer to peer. So you still had to have some intermediaries and then the government came in and shut them down when they started taking off. So Satoshi already knew that if it caught on, if there was someone or some entity to go after that the government would go and shut them down. So the goal was to make it, once it's created and set into the wild, it just spreads and is completely decentralized. No, no CEO, no parent company. And the, and the only way that you can actually make updates to it is I think over 50% over of the nodes have to agree to accept the change that you're submitting. <clears throat> you know, so there is code that runs Bitcoin that everyone's running on nodes across, across the internet. And all those nodes would have to agree to update to the new ver version to make that change go live. <clears throat> So completely decentralized. <sighs> Man, it's kind of warm out here. <sighs> Cross over. <sighs> so that is the new technology. And it's, even though it's crazy, like it seems crazy 
like Bitcoin just got up to $81,000 and you know people knew that it, it started at zero and I've seen it go up and go down and everyone thinks that they're too late like that was something that if I would have got in at back in 2011 when it was cents then you know that could have changed my life and that's true but we're still so early we're really in comparison to the internet adoption phase we're at like the 1990s level when when i first got into the internet no one else really cared about the internet in my school like i was one of the only kids in my whole school that even had the internet <laughs> and i'm feeling the same way with bitcoin where i'm like look at all this <laughs> you know everyone look at this and no one cares <laughs> and i remember like there's you know reports of as it's starting to grow back in like the mid 90s you know news reports be like have you heard about this thing the internet people like oh it's just a fad it's uh it'll never catch on <sighs> you know no one understands it you know businesses were like we don't need no computers we have file cabinets why would you need networked computers <laughs> so no one really understands the technology but then as people adopt it and corporations adopt it and they get a strategic advantage that allows them to outcompete other companies you know when when Microsoft started adding networking and stuff to their computers and AOL created software that allowed people to connect and were able to charge a service. They were like one of the biggest companies in the world back in the 90s. AOL was huge. And so, you know, other people see like, wow, this AOL company is using the internet and they're making tons of money. Maybe we should use the internet. And then that's, that's how it starts spreading. Like money, money really motivates people, especially like, you know, corporations, the bottom line, they shareholders start asking them, why are you not adopting this technology? Like, look at these other companies. They're, they're going to pass you up. Like, you know, small startup companies surpassed, you know, Microsoft, Amazon. Those all started like, you know, 2000, Microsoft, you know, in the 80s. Apple, like all the top companies right now that dwarfed every other company in the world. Like no one re really thought that they were anything back, back when they started. Like Exxon and oil companies and stuff were all the big companies when they were getting started and they weren't, you know, Exxon would just think they're like little peons. But all those companies, use the internet and networks to become the largest companies in the world. And if you had invested in those companies, the early adopters of the internet, you would be stinking filthy rich. You know, imagine if you had bought into Microsoft or Apple or Amazon or Google back when they were, you know, a year old. And, and then back then, people were like, oh my gosh, or Tesla. Te Tesla's a really good comparison to um, Bitcoin because it had so much FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt surrounding it. Like all the stock trading experts you know, we're saying like, you can't start a car company and compete with Ford and Chevy. You know, there's, you know, Tesla's gonna 
go to zero, they're going to be bankrupt. No one wants an electric car. I mean, tons of negative things were coming from stock analysts. And like the valuation of Tesla was, was horrible. They weren't profitable. Their you know, quarterly reports were negative. Same with Amazon. People were like, why would you invest in Amazon? They don't make any money. Like Amazon was investing all their money back into themselves to just grow, to get market share. And, and they, they weren't profitable for a long time, like over a decade. And all the stock analysts, Amazon is not a profitable company, negative earnings, it, it, you know, it's totally overvalued. And, and that's back when it was like, probably, you know, if you t factor all the stock splits, like Tesla was like $2 and Amazon was a dollar. Like with a market cap of under 50 billion, where they're multi-trillions now. <clears throat> so this is what I'm trying to get people to understand with Bitcoin. Even though we have had big run-ups, which Amazon did too back in the early day. If you look at their stock chart, you know, like the dot-com bubble and bust and the 08 financial crisis, the boom and bust. But if you go look at what the stock price was back then, it was minuscule to what it is today. <clears throat> so if you'd have just bought and held those companies, rode all those booms and busts, and went through all the stock splits and got more shares like those shares are so valuable today and that's just what's happening with Bitcoin and uh, as a proxy MicroStrategy so MicroStrategy I think is probably the biggest play even bigger than Bitcoin and they have a 55 billion market cap right now and I believe that they will be a multi trillion dollar company at least within the next 10 years you know so Tesla was you know below 50 billion back when a little over 10 years ago and now they're up to like almost a trillion if they're not already at a trillion and the same the same with Amazon Google 20 25 years ago you know, this is like getting in at that period of time in those companies. But at the time, you could have told people, buy Google, buy Apple, buy Microsoft, buy Tesla. And when they're that early, people just don't trust them. They don't see the advantages of the disruptive technology like the internet. And, and with Tesla, it was really the, the manufacturing process that was their made, major advantage. Like there's so many fewer parts in an electric car that the cost of production's much lower than a conventional vehicle. <clears throat> Man. So yeah. MicroStrategy is just going to take off and it will be highly volatile. It's not going to go up in a straight line from 55 billion to a trillion. It's going to go up to you know 150 billion market cap and fall back down to 100 billion and go up to 300 billion and fall down to 200 billion. And those are like huge swings and people freak out you know even if they bought in let's say they bought in a hundred dollars and it goes up to five hundred dollars but then it drops down to three hundred dollars people freak out they're like oh my god i just lost two hundred dollars per share but really they've still gained two hundred dollars per share 
because they bought it at 100 and it's still at 300. It's not going to go down to 100 again. But people freak out about losing paper gains, <sighs> unrealized gains. And I yet again forgot to bring my sweat rag. I have to use my shirt. So it's really people themselves that uh, limit their gains over a long investing horizon. I think there was some study where they were studying like the uh, retirement portfolios and seeing like who had the best performance and like the top performing retirement portfolios were people that like had never touched it. So you just put your investment in, don't touch it and let it mature. But there, there can be exceptions to that, I think, even though that is the conventional wisdom. Like I had my retirement funds in uh, S&P 500 index funds, which I still do in my 401k because I, that's, that's the highest performing fund that I'm actually able to invest in because I can't invest in individual stocks or ETFs until I quit my job. I have to quit my job and then roll it over into an IRA and then I'd be able to invest in Bitcoin ETFs and MicroStrategy and that's what I'm going to do when the time comes when I actually quit my job. <clears throat> so yeah, over the next 10, 20 years, Bitcoin and then even more so, MicroStrategy. I love these unicycle, electric unicycles. Very cool. Yeah, my Bitcoin and MicroStrategy are going to outperform everything over the next 10 to 20 years. Especially the next 10 years. And, and they're gonna be so far ahead of everyone else that no one else could catch up. Like even uh, Microsoft, that's another catalyst that's potentially on the horizon, is Microsoft. Microsoft in December is having, I don't know if it's like a vote, or board members are going to decide whatever on putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet, like MicroStrategy. <clears throat> so that could be another multiple billions of dollars that Microsoft buys Bitcoin, holds it. And if Microsoft does it, you know, that's one of the top five most valuable companies in the world. If they do it, you know, Amazon's gonna be like, wow, I think we should do it. Tesla has already done it. Tesla bought Bitcoin back in 2020 or 2019, somewhere back then. And that's contributed to the, the big, spike in their values as well so yeah if Microsoft does it other companies will start doing it and everyone will be trying to get a hold of the scarce digital asset that you can't just ramp up production of Bitcoin to to meet demand. The only way to meet demand when there's a limited supply is for the price to go up. And go up it is going to do. It's already gone up I think 50% since, since September when I started making these videos. 
saying that I was going heavily into Bitcoin. And MicroStrategy since that time has gone up over 100%. And I think year to date, Bitcoin's probably getting close to 100 and MicroStrategy's like 250 or more. Like it's, and, and it's not, you haven't missed out. That's, that's the thing. It's kind of the whole point of this whole talk was, you know, people back in the 90s might have thought that they were missing out. They missed out on the internet. Like, as far as like creating an internet company like AOL, you know, AOL beat us to it because they were so dominant at the time. And imagine if everyone was just like, oh, well, AOL won. <laughs> but all the other adoptions of the internet beat them out. But the same thing is true. The underlying network, technology, the internet, that's not going anywhere. No one's made a better internet. We still use the same TCP IP protocol that the internet is built on. And that's what Bitcoin is. There's not gonna be another Bitcoin that takes over Bitcoin. It's the largest network, the most secure network. All the companies and governments are gonna adopt that strongest, most secure network. There's not gonna be another one that comes up and replaces it. They're just, everyone's gonna build on top of the Bitcoin network. And that's really what it is, it's a network. Bitcoin is more like a an internet for for money. I mean, it's a protocol that's transmitted over the internet, but that's what the the technology is. And we're very early. So the value of Bitcoin will be around you know, 10, 10 to $15 million in like 2034, by November, 2034. And th at that point, that's when 99% of all Bitcoin has been mined. And the remaining 1% of Bitcoin will be slowly distributed over the over next hundred years. So that's like, getting to the ultimate scarcity level of Bitcoin. It becomes more and more scarce every four years. And that's why every four years is a cycle. And every four years, the price has to go up to meet demand because the network is growing. So it's, it's, it's not gonna go back down again. We're never gonna go back to dial up internet. You know, that's, that's how ridiculous it is when someone says, you know, Bitcoin's gonna go back down to zero or Bitcoin's going back down to $100. It's not because it's the network. The network has already, that's, that's, that's a reflection of the adoption of the decentralized secure network. So if you look at the adoption of the internet on a graph, that's like saying that, you know, this is, this is gonna crash. We're gonna go back to only 10,000 internet users, you know, in the next four years. Like maybe if, uh, <laughs> if an asteroid hits or something, but you know, just, just the adoption of the internet, we're not going back to 10,000 internet users ever. It's going up and it's gonna go up forever until you run out of people that are there to adopt it. That's, that's really the, 
the limit of the network. Once every single person in the world is using it, there, you've maxed, you've maxed out your network. But you know, even the, the population growth of the world, you know, more and more people are here every year, so more and more people will adopt the network. And you know, and older people, they're slow or they won't even adopt the network. There's, you know, old people back in the 90s that never used the internet and never would. Like my grandma, she might, you know, internet things might affect her, but she's not an internet user. Like we got her a picture frame that, you know, digital pictures automatically popped up on the, on the picture frame that were sent over the internet, but that's about as much as she adopted the internet. She's not doing Google searches and <laughs> I guess she has watched like the Fox News app and streamed Fox News over the internet. That's, that's her uh, adoption of it. But as the younger people come in, they're more apt to adapt the network. So, you know, kids that are 10 to 15 years old right now in 10 years, they're definitely going to have Bitcoin. They're definitely going to be using the internet. The internet network is going to grow. The Bitcoin network is going to grow. They're never going to go back down to where they were now. <clears throat> and if you, you project this out into the future, you know, at the same adoption rate of the, as the internet, which it will be, project that into the future, the Bitcoin network and how many users will have it, and then how much Bitcoin will have to cost for all those users to have it. It's like 10 to $15 million per Bitcoin. <clears throat> and so at that market cap, currently at $81,000 a Bitcoin, we are at zero, we're at eight tenths, eight tenths of 1% of, of that market cap right now. So less than 1%. So it's like buying in Microsoft or Apple when it was eight tenths of 1% the stock price. But even if you went back that far to Amazon or to Apple or to Microsoft and you talk to the experts at the time, they say, oh, Microsoft's overvalued. Amazon's overvalued. No one's going to adopt the internet. Internet's a fad. That's where we are with Bitcoin. <clears throat> Not everyone sees it, but I saw it with the internet. And I've always been an early adopter of technology and can kind of see where things are going with it. And that's where things are going. Not financial advice, but just saying, look into Bitcoin <laughs> and think of it as a network, not really as funny, imaginary internet money, which I think that's the thing that, it's kind of a miss misnomer of, of what Bitcoin is. It's not funny, imaginary internet money. It's a decentralized and secure network. The most secure network that's ever been created and will ever be created. That can't be broken if you used all the computers in the world for over a billion years to try to get into it. No other network in the world could say that. And that decentralization and security is valuable and how valuable it is is over 99% more valuable than it is right now and it'll get to that point over the next 10 years the end thanks for watching and I'll talk to you later take it easy